Hello and welcome to episode 97 of the Rollo and Slappy Show. Today is June 25th, 2018. I am Rollo McFlugel and with me is Slappy Jones 2 and we are both of McFlugel.com. The show notes page for this episode is McFlugel.com slash 97 where you'll be able to find links to the things we're talking about as well as ways to follow and subscribe to everything we do and also to check out our sponsor, LibertyMugs.com, where uh, we sell mugs that are libertarian-themed and some other just goofy, funny stuff that we think is cool. And uh, also, if you want to get a free Liberty Mug and you were thinking about subscribing to Tom Wood's Liberty Classroom, if you follow the link, click the link that we provide on the show notes page to sign up for the Tom Wood's Liberty Classroom, we will send you a free Liberty Mug. Just let us know somehow like email or something, so we know that uh, it was you who signed up, and uh, we'll take care of that for you. So uh, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Slappy, and he's going to introduce our episode topic. Thank you, Rallo. Welcome, everyone, to the Rallo and Slappy Show. I'm Slappy Jones, too. (laughs) Today, we're going to be talking about an episode of the Joe Rogan Experience from June 13th, in which Dave Rubin was on the show. And uh, it's three hours long, uh, but it was a good discussion. So the the specific part we're going to be talking about is about the two hour mark, a little later than that, about two oh five or two oh seven in that range, where Ruben and Rogan talked about regulations, and uh, Ruben was pretty much Dave Ruben was pretty much arguing that um, we don't really don't need government for much. And Rogan, one of the points he made was, well, we certainly need them for building codes. Um, and just so you know, in case you're not aware of either of these two, uh, if you listen to podcasts, you should be. Dave Rubin hosts the podcast. So does Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan has one of the biggest podcasts uh, online. So um, he usually has some interesting guests and some good discussions. But uh, he also used to host Fear Factor and uh, does some commentary for MMA. Dave Rubin. Was, it, was Dave Rubin a liberal? Yes. I think he's on the Young Turks. Yeah, Young Turks or something. And now he kind of does his own thing, has his own show. Yeah, I think he he calls himself a classical liberal. Yes, he does. Um, So anyway, they were on talking about all kinds of stuff. And one of the points came up was building code regulations. And uh, so Rallo listened to it. Do we... Well, go ahead. I'm going to pass it on to you and uh, let's hear your thoughts. (laughs) Just throwing it at you. Oh, okay. Um... Yeah, so Dave Rubin was kind of making the point that, and he's, and he he kept saying that I don't believe that we don't need any government regulation. I think there should be some. He did say there was a, yeah, he kept saying that. But he was making the arguments and he was trying to argue the points and he said he thinks it's interesting and and I think he's he's genuinely curious about it. That's what I like about him. Um, Yeah, absolutely. um, But. This is where Slappy and I can come in and say, we do think that there is no need for the government to get involved, and actually they do more harm than good, and that the market could handle this on its own a lot better. So I think one of the issues that uh, Dave Rubin was having when Rogan was pressing him on it, and and Rogan claimed some experience, uh, I think he said his father was an architect, and he used to work in construction for a little bit, and he was saying, look, guys will you know, take shortcuts all the time and do shoddy work. If there's not someone on top of them, uh, vis-a-vis the government, making sure that they're following building code. And, uh, Dave, Rubin- and he talked about it. He, he said, so, you know, one, one of the immediate responses, well, insurance companies will do it. And he said, and yeah, you know, I'm taking his word. He said, there's a big difference when an insurance inspector comes on the site, when a code inspector comes on the site. And yes. people fear the code inspector. Yeah, that's uh, we were talking before the show, and I kept saying I forget something I wanted to say, yeah. and that's that's a that's something I wanted to talk about. So remind yeah. me to talk about the insurance versus the building code inspector. Yeah, yeah, that's all right. I'm gonna write um, that one down. I forget the point I was gonna make now. <laughs> uh, what was I gonna say? Um, oh, and so he was saying, you know, Rogan was saying that. They do. They're going to do shoddy work. They're going to take shortcuts and everything. He goes, you know, a lot of these builders are, are jerks, and so they, they don't just care. want to get paid any way they can, right? 
And so Ruben was making the point that, well, it's competition. And, you know, if they build a crappy house and it falls down on someone, then that's the reputation. And with the competition, those who do good, they, they would never be able to get work again if the houses they were building were falling down. Um, and that's true. But in a free market with free market regulation, I don't think it would even get to that point where we have to wait until houses are falling down before you can identify uh, if if you should use a builder or not. There's a yeah, huge so, in- yeah, there's a huge incentive that if you're going to buy a house, yeah. that you want to make sure that it's not going to fall down on you or there's not going to well, be issues that come up. As, as Rogan said, five or 10 years down the line, it takes a while for them to manifest themselves because it's, it's it, not every issue is going to be uh, an immediate failure. Right. And that's true. I mean, I worked for a plumber when I was younger. And every time we would build, you know, dig up a, a bathroom or something, almost 100% of the time, I would say, or damn close to it, we'd pull up the floor and the plumber would say, this isn't up to code every yeah. time. Um, well, even my house, I mean, I, I've been in my house for about two and a half years and the house was built in like 2000. So it's not, not an old house, but there's all sorts of stuff that I'm finding in my house that I, uh, drives me crazy. I, I, it's a, I say it all the time. If you really want to hate someone, buy a house from them. Yeah. Cause you find out all the, the sins that they've committed doing stuff. Um, so to get, get back to the point of would you need your house to be falling down in order to know if if someone's a good uh, builder or not. Um, no one wants that. Um, and, and Rogan was making the point. It's like, well, if you don't have code, if the government doesn't provide code, you know, it's a lot of time and resources and energy that someone would have to devote. Just an average Joe doesn't understand the correct way to build a house or anything and and it's it's kind of absurd to expect them to be able to do that and i agree yeah he even said um he said asked dave he said uh, dave rubin he asked them if he uh, ever had something built or something like that and rubin said he just bought a house but uh rubin clarified and said no i mean a construction site he's like your, your regular joe who's on goes and looks at the house he's not gonna know he's not gonna have take the time to study what the proper way to build is and what how close uh, an electrical line should be to a pipe and you know all that stuff and he's not going to have any idea so you need someone who knows that being the building code these things that he can trust which i thought was very interesting that he said that and didn't just be a little creative or think a little deeper into that right well first of all the the big point to make is that if joe rogan understands all these issues and Dave Rubin understands all these issues. And basically anyone that you would say, we don't need the government to regulate building codes. They would say, what about all the companies that are going to take shortcuts and everything? There's an obviously huge demand for uh, the safe construction of buildings. And, 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 you know, the like. So people do think about it. They do care about it. Um, when, when you buy a house now, you bring inspectors in to look at things. Um, I had a, a general home inspector look at stuff. I had someone to inspect my septic system. I had someone come in and inspect the pump. I had someone inspect the water quality. Um, you know, anything that you need a, a little bit better knowledge of, you want some assurance that when you buy it, it's not going to be a lemon. And so you spend a little bit extra money up front in order to not have to pay a lot of money down the line if something goes wrong. You want to catch it in the, in the front. And w- what, what do we call that sort of thing when you spend a little bit of money to assure yourself that you're not going to have to spend a whole lot later down the line if something goes wrong? It's insurance. Yeah, I mean, yeah certainly similar to insurance anyway. Right. And so when you buy a house, I mean – Anyone who buys a house or, or builds a building or property, they typically insure it. And if they don't purchase insurance from someone, then they're probably self-insuring. Um, but either way, it, it, it works out the same way. But for the sake of argument, for you know, since Rogan was talking about everyday people, 
buying houses and and not understanding uh, the finer finer details of of housing construction. Um, you know, people are going to get a loan. Most people get loans to buy houses, and so if the house falls down, house really isn't worth that much. Um, and so they would need the person would need to to rebuild it. So. Um, and the bank wants to make sure if the house falls down that the, the owner doesn't just run away from his loan because what, what's he paying a loan for, for something that's not worth anything. And so there's this incentive among the homeowner and the bank to make sure if something goes wrong, that there's money there to, can, to, to, to build it back to make the person whole if, if something goes wrong, especially if it's the fault of someone else. So that's why you know, you typically need to buy insurance because people don't have the ability to just, if they're getting a loan in the first place to buy a house, they don't have the the money available probably to completely rebuild the house if it falls down. So there's a big incentive by both parties and even the third party, the builder. Yeah, no, I mean, there's huge incentive. First of all, if you're buying a house, it falling down, forget paying for it you don't want your house to fall down right so one when you're going to buy a building you don't want the building to fall down right you, you would know. spend a little bit of money to hire right. and and this is where i wish rogan like you said put two and two together and said, well the insurance inspector not much compared to the code inspector right now maybe but without the government uh developing codes and standards and sending inspectors out you don't why wouldn't an insurance company yeah fill that insurance void? company or a market i mean we we really don't know how a free market would work right insurance companies are certainly a huge possibility because whenever there's a chance to uh transfer risk people generally like to do that but what about like uh inspection companies that pop up right um we don't have government building codes, which if you want to talk about incentives, what incentive does the government have at all other than fining you for, for violating? That's how they would be paid. Right. They don't get paid when things go well. Well, here's the thing. Um, here's the thing about all this is that we actually have real world examples of this. It's not just all theorizing and saying that, like, well, I can guess it's going to work like this. It may not be exactly in the in the, in the housing, and because I'm not that familiar with with building residential building codes. Um, but I do know that the National Fire Protection Agency, which develops fire codes, was privately developed because businesses realized that if their buildings were burning down, especially in industrial settings. If a, fa a factory owner realizes if his factory burns down, then he has no way of making money. In addition to that, he's got to rebuild it, and he doesn't want to have to spend capital on that. He'd, you know, it's the broken window thing. You'd much rather spend capital on improvements than capital on just rebuilding stuff and and spending money to be in the same position that you were before. So people developed fire codes and insurance companies loved it because if you applied these codes to your building then the insurance companies felt pretty good that you weren't going to uh burn your burn your factory down right. and Have so a was, fire that was unnecessary right and so it could have been avoided right right and so it was less likely that they were going to have to pay out and so if it's less likely that they're going to have to pay out and they and they want to incentivize you to do that then they lower their rates to, to people that, that apply those codes. And furthermore, you know, they say, well, how do you know that, um, that they're following the codes? They could just say, oh, yeah, we're following the codes and then never do it. Well, they would send inspectors out. And it may be the insurance company themselves or they'll send a third party out. There can be, you know, businesses that get developed that really know and understand the code. And then they go out when, when the insurance company or any other interested party Wants to go verify it. I mean, it happens where I, it's going to be it's going to be a joke now on the, on the podcast if it's not already. You know, I work at an oil refinery, and we get audited by third parties on behalf of someone else to make sure that 
you know, because there's other business interests involved in an, in an oil refinery. Um, they want to make sure that we're operating correctly, safely, that we're not going to, you know, burn the place down or something or have an, have a, have a, have an accident. And there are private standards there too. I mean, I think I've mentioned it before, but American Society of Mechanical Engineers, American P- Petroleum Institute, the ASME was, was founded, the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, ASME, that was founded in the late 19th century because of the railroads that you had, uh, trains were, were pulled by steam engines and the boilers on the steam engines were blowing up a lot. And so you had the issue of, one, they were destroying their capital equipment, the engines. Two, it was clogging up lines because now you've got a a train that's in pieces and they have to go clean it up, take whatever's left, pull it back. So now you, you, you clog a track up, a line up. You can't, one, that train can't get to its destination. And two, anything else it was going to use, it can't use it for a while. So you're hurting your bottom line there. Two, you're killing people. That's not good. Um, and so, uh, you lose consumer trust if it's like, man, I might blow up if I go ride this train. And so a bunch of engineers got together and they, they developed, uh, the pressure vessel code. And they said, if you build your boilers to this code, or it wasn't the pressure vessel code, sorry, it was the boiler code. It was the original one. If you build your boiler on your steam engine to this code and maintain it according to our code, we basically guarantee that you're not going to blow it up. And so the railroads loved it. The banks loved it. Insurance companies loved it. It created wealth for every, for all parties. It was better mm-hmm. for everyone, including the consumers. So whether or not they intended to be a consumer uh, advocacy group, they are. They were, and they continue to be. Because now the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, I mean, there's all sorts of codes and standards they develop across all. Uh, also, you know, industry, heavy industry, like, uh, like petrochemical and, and everything else, anything that has, a, uh, you know, pressure containing parts. Um, so we, we very heavily use it in the, uh, refining industry. So they have, what they do is that they, um, they provide, uh, stamps to people really to, to manufacturers and repair companies that they say, if you build your, your pressure vessel or your boiler to our codes uh, and we go and audit you and make sure that you're doing it, we'll provide you with a stamp that you can stamp on the nameplate. And that stamp means that this was built to the code and you can be sure that as long as you maintain it according to the code, you're not going to have a, you know, it's not going to blow up. And so that's very important um, to the business and whoever's financing them and to the insurance company. Mm -hmm. Um, And so there's no reason why that couldn't be applied similarly to building homes and and other buildings. And and it doesn't just stop there. They provide stamps to repair companies and they go and audit these places to make sure that they're continuing to follow, follow what's going on. And if you lose that stamp, your business is destroyed. So there, there is no force of, of the law there, but it is, you are finished if you lose your stamp. Um, and so you continue to ask the questions, well, you know, all right, you're, you're building a, a pressure vessel and it's probably with some sort of steel. How do you, how do you know, how do you know where you're getting your steel from? How do you know that your steel is going to be good? Because, you know, there's a lot that goes into manufacturing steel, the process of, of how you, how you make it. Like if you have a steel beam, can jet fuel melt it? Yeah, exactly. Um, there's a lot that goes into, to, to building steel. And how do you know if, if the pressure vessel manufacturer is building a vessel and they're buying steel plate and they say that I want, uh, I want material X, Y, Z. How do they know that they're getting what they think they're getting? Well, there's standards for that. Um, the American Society of Testing and Measurement. I think that's what ASTM stands for. But they develop, and, and there's, there's, a sort, there's all sorts of other. There's multiple, like, different industry, grades. Well, yeah, different you grades you of don't steel. don't know about them, yeah. Different grades so of steel are known by different designations because 
you know, it, it, there's crossover between all these companies that, that regulate this kind of thing, that they develop these standards. So it's all standardized. And if you're a foundry and you're producing this material, it's the same kind of thing. When you produce this material, you're saying, I build it to this. Here's, and they send out uh, material test reports that, you know, is the evidence, is there, is there kind of promise of conformity to it? And you send out augers to it. And then actually where I work, when, whenever we uh, bring in any sort of alloy that's not carbon steel, we PMI everything, which is a positive material identification. It's, it's like a gun, not a gun, but it's like a little thing that you press onto the metal and it, and it can tell you what the, the, the uh, strength, density, whatever. Well, yeah, but mostly the, like the material makeup, it'll tell you like, uh, it's got this much carbon, this much silicone, nice. uh, this much magnesium in it. So you, you have a way of, of verifying it and there's, there's auditors and everything. And then, and then you say, okay, well, there's in that, in this industry, there's a lot of welding that's involved in welding. I mean, it's, you're asking, asking welds to take, take a lot. And, you know, if you have a bad weld, it can be really bad. So the ASME and API and other organizations develop welding codes and standards. And they say that, I mean, it's so in depth of what you have to do. It's like the procedure that you have, how you qualify the procedure, how you make sure that your welder is is certified to perform these welds, what kind of welding wire you can use, how thick it can be, how you store the welding wire, um, how fast he's supposed to weld, what position the weld's going to be, um, what welding process you can use. Like every every step of the way, and then how to test the weld. Um, you know, it, there's there's techniques like there's you can X-ray welds to see if it's done correctly. There's visual techniques you can you can use. There's a uh, things called uh, penetrant testing and and magnetic particle testing that you can do. Um, there's you know like hydro testing too, where you, you pump it full of water and you pressurize it, basically trying to break it. Um, uh, there's, there's what temperature you can do it at, um, with the welding. I mean, there's every, every step of but, the way it's being validated and stepped out and tested and made sure uh, even, even qualify, you get a welder and, and you want to make sure you can weld. They have procedures and, and codes and standards on, all right, you got to take as a, 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 a test coupon of what he welded. And these are all the tests you got to do on it destructive test to make sure that he's qualified to weld. And when you bring welders in the refinery, because, you know, depending on the workload we have, we don't always have in-house the, the labor to accomplish what we need to do, especially when there's a, a turnaround, when, when you're taking a whole unit down, you're doing a bunch of maintenance work. So you bring in contractors, so you bring in welders off the street. And a lot of places, you know, Maybe the union shop or whoever the contractor is, they'll they'll test their welders. But a lot of times, the the business itself that's bringing in the welders will make the welders do tests on site because they want to make sure that they're getting good welds. I mean, there's there's for something as complicated as oil refinery and petrochemicals and all that stuff and and this heavy industry that is you know. I know there's there's accidents that happen sometimes. No one, nothing's per, unfortunately nothing's perfect, um, and really these when you look at these accidents in the industry, if you really it, it's someone does something that they should not do, something that you know it's um, as risky as as many hazards as there are in like oil refining and heavy industry. Um, there's you know safety is very important. And we take it very seriously. And the uh, the mindset that's there is that every accident is preventable. And you and if you look at every accident that happens, whether it's someone, you know, busts their, you know, smacks their thumb and, and busts it up or, or there's an explosion, you look back, someone did something that they should not have done, um, that there are many layers of protection that, that went wrong. And it's not just because of, oh, you know, oh, it's someone did something that they were explicitly not supposed to do. Right. Um, so how about to Joe Rogan's point, though? So that's fine. That's great. That's like a bajillion dollar investment building an oil refinery. What about a guy 
who's building a home development, which is still a significant investment, but it's a lot different. You build a house, you don't like the oil refinery. You guys are there. You're continually working it, keeping all the stuff up to your codes and your specifications to remain safe. What about the guy who buys a house and knows nothing about construction, nothing about keeping things in order? Home builder builds a house five, 10 years down the road, all the problems start arising. Right. So like we were saying earlier, hopefully, you know, he's probably buying insurance or even, even not ignoring that aspect of it. He wants to, he wants to have some peace of mind that his house isn't going to fall down on him or that he's just not going to have, I think uh, Rogan brought up mold. Did he bring up mold? But he brought up something I think I already mentioned. He said like five to ten years down the line, something comes up. Yep. You know, he he wants to protect himself from that. So he want, he's going to want to bring in a third party who's an expert right. on this. Maybe he's going to bring in Joe Rogan. Maybe and Joe Rogan you know decides that, hey, I see this thing. I can charge someone and I can advertise it to people and say, hey, if you pay me 200 bucks, I can watch them. Or whatever right. the price is. I don't know what the exactly. price is going to be. But I can watch them build the house. There's certain points where there's going to be hold points. And this is the same thing. It's it's a it's a perfect it's the same foil continues to be for oil refining or any other industry. Is that there's hold points. Right. And when you want someone to inspect it, they shall stop and have the inspector come and look at it and make sure they're doing what they're supposed to do. And if they don't make that hold point and they keep going then, you know, as long as you made them sign a contract on how this is how they're going to build the house and they violated it. Right. And that's the um, that's the problem with having government codes is it's like as long as it's the like everything in theory has to be to this code. So nobody. Yeah, the, the code inspectors could come and check, but everyone just kind of assumes it's there. There's not as much due diligence because of these codes. Um, right. But like, like like you said, I mean, most people who are buying houses aren't buying new construction. So my house was built a long time ago. When they inspected it, they didn't tear down the walls to see where the pipes are. Um, any changes that are made to a house after it's built, there's really no way anyone can stop that, right? Like if I decide to do my own plumbing – there's no building code inspector who's going to come. There's no, maybe my insurance company would want to know about it. And they may, I, I haven't attempted to do my own plumbing, but they may have something in the contract or when you, when you redo the home insurance that asks about that. Uh, so it would be important to know. Oh, they, doing. they probably do. And just, you know, it's funny cause this got brought up with my family recently where, uh, my brother bought a, a little welding machine and my dad made the point. He was like, hey, you, you better look at your insurance contract because, you know, welding, there's a mm -hmm. hazard associated with it. You could, you know, there's right. ways, ways to, to start a fire doing that. And if they don't know about that. Are they going to cut it? If it's explicitly excluded, like there could right. be all kinds of things in that contract that you should look at. But and it's, know about. you want to make sure. But there's no way a building code inspector from the state would have any idea. They don't even have an incentive. There's no reason for them. But the insurance company does have the incentive to hope your house is safe. Right. Um, so when we talk, it, Rogan brought up incentives and said that without basically the force of the state, there is no incentive to do things. But I, I like you were explaining in your industry, there certainly is and would be uh, probably even more. Uh, incentives aligning to to help things go smoothly and we all live safely in our houses. But another thing that Joe Rogan mentioned before in, we are you going to talk about pollution? I wasn't going to go. I, okay. I was going to bring up a real quick point on this because and and I know what your answer will be or I think I do. So Joe Rogan said he did bring up uh, why the government needs one of the reasons anyway why we need government building codes is because look at the third world in the third world they don't have these regulations and they have school buildings collapsing on children now of course he didn't cite an example of that happening but i'll take his word and i, I believe that could be the case so what do you think rallo if if we took the building code of the united states and dropped it in the sudan do you think there the buildings would stop collapsing no 
<laughs> Neither do I. <laughs> it takes I mean, a little bit of capital and some wealth before you can get to that point. Like a hundred years from now, they'll look back and laugh at the way we build things today because we, assuming we continue to get wealthier as a society and have more capital. Um, well, it's it's funny that people look back and act like they just didn't care back in the day. Because like right. you said, a hundred years from now, people are going to look back and say, like, those people are absolute idiots. I can't believe that they, you know. Assuming we keep getting wealthier as a society. Right. There's those, no guarantee they'll, that that they'll, can, they'll look uh, at but, normal thing X, Y, Z that we do today and say that we're absolute idiots for doing it that way. How dangerous we were, even though we think it's perfectly normal. you people in cages for yeah. having a plan on them? But but um, but things that like we we always look back and, and judge it by today's standards. But you know back the then, shops, right? Right back then, or what what it's going to end up being looking back in the future is that that's the best that was available. It was the best option. It's like going and working in in a in a factory and and breathing the nasty stuff in the coal mine. Um, you know, you you can say all you want that it's the evil company didn't care about that or they were just stupid or anything, but it was the better option that they had otherwise. And as as their options got better, and instead of working at a coal mine, they could work some somewhere else. You know, the the owner of the coal mine had to create incentives for them to to continue to, to work there. Maybe so. Maybe he had to figure out ways to clean the air up to make it a little more pleasant. Maybe he had to pay them a little bit more. I mean, it's it's just basic competition right um supply and demand and as we get wealthier as as we get more productive like as more machines do work for humans that allows humans to do other things that they didn't have to do previously making jobs safer right more efficient maybe spend less time at work or whatever the case is and and be able to live a comfortable life um by doing less manual labor and safer safer jobs and as more capital is invested in these countries, they could stop using, you know, doing things by hand and have that stuff done by machines and then use that human capital to do other things. Uh, and so all the codes in the world aren't, isn't going to make Bangladesh rich. It's going to take capital investment. Right. And anyway, I mean, the government normally is trailing on that anyway. Well, they always are by almost by definition. You need It's, it's the regulation 50. isn't making us safe. It's that they develop safer better ways of doing stuff and the government comes in applies these rules and then takes credit for it it's like if you look yeah. at osha look at you know they love to show the chart of when osha started and the number of work the rate of workplace injuries was dropping but what they don't do is show that graph before the 20 years before right and it was know, already on that sure. trajectory so right. and that's what happens they see things and then they apply it to everything before the economy may allow it which right. just causes a drag on the economy the the microcosm of that was barack obama was against gay marriage and then when the public opinion changed on it that most people just didn't care or were in favor of it he changed yep so yeah he wasn't a leader he wasn't leading on that he didn't put stick his neck out there and take a bold stance um that's why it's funny we call them leaders they're always yeah. followers and almost by the definition of followers you need half the people to yep I, I, I want to talk about uh pollution because that was brought up too yes. but before that i want to bring up just another thing because they were talking about consumer advocacy and i remember it was a couple of years ago that I was watching, I was reading an article or something about Elizabeth Warren was saying that, like, talking about regulation and saying that you can thank government that your toaster doesn't burn your house down. And I wrote an article about this because when I heard her say that, I ran downstairs, grabbed the toaster, flipped it over, and took a picture of the, the tag. The sticker was on there because on the sticker was the UL symbol, which stands for Underwriters Laboratory which is a private organization that develops codes and standards for consumer electronics and, and not just electric, uh, like every, uh, all kinds so, of things, right? But, yeah. Factory mutual is another one. There's all sorts of, there's a, there's a bunch of them like that. And if you look at any piece of electrical, well, I bet you else, everybody listening to this has seen that UL sticker yes, and wondered every, what it was. Yeah. Everyone knows it. They see it might not put two and two together what it is. And I mean, that's the beauty of the market is that you have private regulation Dealing with all this stuff, you don't even you don't even you don't realize really it's happening. It. Yeah. You don't have to know about it. it doesn't matter. 
uh, not that it doesn't matter. It's, it doesn't say, it matter. Matters, yeah, it doesn't. It, it doesn't matter to you uh, who's doing it exactly, but it just that it's getting done. Uh, that that's really amazing. That it doesn't have to be guided. It just happens. Right. And anyway, I mean, to say that the state, even even small amounts of regulation, and and Dave Rubin, to his credit, was kind of alluding to this that he's like, well, how how do we know that the government's going to be experts on how to regulate this stuff? But there's so much. I just brought up earlier the oil refining, and I was really only scratching the surface about what's involved in all that private uh, codes and standards there. But for the government to think, to be able to regulate just the basics of things, you look at food, uh, transportation, so you look at boats, planes, trains, automobiles and anything else um you look at different industries you and then you look at the financial sectors uh you look at insurance um you, you, building codes i mean everything under the sun i mean when people say they want a little bit of regulation that's what they mean they mean like everything just a little bit of regulation but there's so much and so many aspects to it that it's an impossible task for a single entity to do that, it's got to be huge. It's got to be unwieldy. And they were saying, before they started talking about regulation, they were talking about how the government's way too big and is so wasteful and and it, and it doesn't work. And so it's the same government. It's yeah, like, it's like the point. Actually, yeah, it's, no, the point, it's the point that Jeff Dice made about uh, having the government regulate immigration. And he's like, they just, you know, people like to act like it's just this small aspect of government but just regulation you look at all that it's got to do it it becomes an unwieldy monster just to regulate who who can come into the country i mean it's it's a lot that's got to happen it's not just a small government that does that it's a massive government and even this small amount of regulation that they're talking about it's a massive amount of regulation and when they mess that up the government never blames itself the government just says, well, we don't have enough control. We don't have enough money. We don't have enough power. We need to regulate this other thing that caused this thing. It's it's what's, it's what's the same cycle that happens over and over again. So it's not a small deal to just say, well, the government should regulate some stuff. Just a little bit here and there. Because, I mean, you look at any industry, there's there's so much stuff that goes on. So you really want the people that are experts in that field to be the people that are kind of leading the charge on it. That's all I had to say about that. Yeah. No, I was, I was, what I was going to say was at one point, Dave Rubin said something like, you know, if government was really efficient and did things great, I wouldn't be a libertarian. Or he said something along those lines. Um, and I thought that was interesting because that's true to a lot of people, right? Everybody wants regulation. Everybody wants to know, that what they're going to buy is safe. And that's what I mean by regulation, not government regulation, but regulation in the market. Everybody wants that. And so if government did a good job of it and didn't steal money and all that other stuff, whatever, people wouldn't notice it and wouldn't care. And that's what private regulation is. And that that's what you were talking about with UL. No one, everyone sees the stickers. No one really thinks about it. Um, and so they don't get as much credit as they deserve for helping to regulate uh, electronics. Yeah, I mean, I say it all the time that I think that because when when a lot of libertarians talk about life without government, they start reinventing the wheel. And I think even a lot of libertarians and anarchists do it, that they give the government way too much credit. There's so much happening right now that's private re privately regulated. So much of life. Happens because and of private regulation, private codes, and private standards that we don't even realize it. I mean, we don't even know it's happening. And I and I think a good way to think about it is whatever uh, industry that you work, or profession that you work in, I'm sure there's that sort of regu private regulation, private codes, private whatever in there that you abide by. So just think about what you what you yourself do, and think right. about how that's structured and everything, and then realize that all right, what your specialty is is just a tiny, 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 tiny slice of the pie that makes up the entire world's economy. So just kind of expand that out and you'll realize, whoa, there's a lot, a lot more that's going on than I realize. So, you know, when, when we talk about, well, how would this, how would we 
live without government in this way. I mean, it's probably already happening that there's private ways of, of doing basically everything. It's just let them do more of it. Right. Uh, so pollution. Yeah. He mentioned, well, we need the uh, government to, to keep pollution from happening, I guess. Yeah, he talked about <laughs> that. He said, uh, uh, what did he say? If there's like a company polluting waters and Dave Rubin responded something like, yeah, well, we all have cell phones and Snapchat and Instagram and Twitter and everyone's walking around with a camera. And if there was a company polluting, I mean, that wouldn't be able to be kept a secret. Everyone would know about it. And that wouldn't be good for business, um, which I think he's correct. But I don't think uh, that's very convincing or um, I agree. I, I agree. Yeah, but, he's he's not he's certainly not wrong, but I don't blame Rogan for kind of dismissing that point. Yeah. Um, and I mean, we see it. We, that is a thing. We We do see people pull up cell phones and hold people accountable, but there are better mechanisms for it. Um, think of it this way. You know, people act like, well, people have the idea in their heads that, you know, if you just dump stuff into the river and it goes downstream, it's like, well, you know, no one really owns the river, so who cares? But but just imagine if I was, uh, um, I mean, what's the difference between water carrying something to your property versus the air carrying something to your property? So if Slappy and I are neighbors and I... um, I don't know, take a vegetation killer out and just start spraying it in the air and the wind blows it onto his property and um, kills all my plants. Right. I can't sit there and just be like, well, I didn't like go walk on his property and dump it there. It was the air that moved it there. So it's not really my fault. No, I would absolutely be held accountable for that. It was my actions. Whether or not I intended that it was harming him or not, my actions caused him slappy harm. So he would, I would be liable to the damages there. So there's really no difference in polluting water upstream to downstream on someone. Um, you know, I, I don't think that you can make every sort of, cl- like, you know, if someone drops a, a leaf in the in the river that you don't like, that's not really causing you harm. But that's why there would be, <laughs> we can, They'll turn into who's going to arbitrate that? There, you know, can we just uh, can we just say that we'll accept that there would be private courts in a free society right, because private right. courts exist today already? Yeah, maybe we could do an episode on that and just yeah. kind of talk about it more in depth. But there certainly will be liability in a free society. Yes, like you just can't do whatever you want. And we talked about insurance companies, um, giant businesses, big businesses, even small and medium sized businesses, all have some kind of liability insurance. Mm-hmm. Um, Without that, they're bearing the risk of them causing harm. And that would certainly be something they would be on the lookout for. That would be a huge liability if you're dumping chemicals into the water that cause harm. And also, let's not gloss over the fact that it's the government's fault that you can't like sue a company like that today for pollution. If, if they're causing you harm, it's during the Industrial Revolution that... The courts decided that, well, we don't want to harm progression, right. progression, progress. So we're going to turn a blind eye to people who bring up lawsuits against these companies because, you know, we, we want the industry. And so before that, companies would have to deal with the liability, like you said, the liability of, of harming other people's property. But then the government stepped in and said, well, no, you don't. And then now, because of this, because people can't, sue companies that are causing them harm now the government's like we need to we need to rein in these companies now they're making these you know not good regulations Other regulations on top of it also i mentioned the uh api american petroleum institute part of their standards involve uh you know issues with pollution and so you'll have th- there would be an element of that kind of thing where they'll you know maybe maybe they'll a, a private regulator will will add on those things things that are uh, of benefit to society um and and make that inclusive with their other standards i mean also it is just as a side note as an engineer i mean when you get your your degree conferred upon you at graduation you take an oath 
that you, you know, keep the public's interest in mind, that you will do no harm to the public, that as an engineer, you have the, res- you accept the responsibility of, of saying no to things that are going to cause people harm. That's right. The world rests this is on true. Rollo's shoulders. This is true. Actually, the world does revolve, the world does revolve around engineers because we picked the coordinate system. That's probably funny to someone out there. I hope you enjoyed it. I would say Car Camp it would, but he's just a civil engineer, so you probably won't get it. Well, we'll find out <laughs> if he listens to our show. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, so it's it's it doesn't matter. It's a getting back to the uh, you know the pollution thing. It doesn't matter if it's because that's the argument people say. Oh, well, a company with with that big with all those lawyers will be able to to outgun you and outman you in a court case and you'll they'll just litigate you to so you have to drop it well i mean if you bring a cut and dry case to a court you know it doesn't matter how much you spend on your lawyers if some things are slam dunks and it used to be that way before that's also i mean if that's what your argument against it is that happens today yeah. Oh, yeah. It, no, it With still does. Government courts. Yeah. I mean, especially like the government can do that to anyone they want. They can put whoever they want out of business. You can just they can sue you all day. They can mm-hmm. fine you all day, and you can fight it all day. But they have unlimited resources and literally unlimited. Well, you know, within the system, they don't have a budget. Right. That's true. And they they can bankrupt whoever they want. Um, that's doesn't seem like a very good system. So if that's your argument against private courts, well, it should be your argument against the courts we have today. Exactly. Uh, do you have anything else on either pollution or anything <coughs> else that was said? No, just that I I did enjoy that episode. I like both Joe Rogan and Dave Rubin. Oh yeah. Um, it was a good conversation. I just it was like. Like we were saying before we went on, there was some things that Ruben was saying where we were like, oh, man, he's almost there. Just take it that next step. So what you're saying is that we should have been his coach there. Um, well, we should have been the ones on the show. Is oh, what that's I'm really true. saying. So I'm just waiting for that invitation from Joe Rogan and we'll be happy to go on Joe anytime um, you need us. We'll be on the show. Are you saying you wouldn't accept an invitation to Dave Rubin's show? I would, oh. but. Um, yeah, actually, that, that's what we'll do. We'll start with Dave Rubin. Dave, give us a call. Shoot us a tweet. We'll come on your show. We'll discuss all these private regulations. And then, um, Rogan, then we'll go on your show. Yeah. But uh, but no, Dave, Dave Rubin's always open to good discussion. And he has a really good podcast that you should maybe listen to when you're done listening to our show every week. Yep. Well, I think he's good. I mean, just to talk about Rubin for a little bit. I think he's good because he brings a lot of people that aren't. I know he doesn't call him. Uh, although, I don't, does he call himself a libertarian now? Sometimes. I mean, he still always says classical liberal. Right. But but, re- I, but regardless, he brings a lot of people that are not libertarians or classical liberals to listen to a show. Yeah. And, and, he and just the fact that he's so like open and ideas will discuss and, and yeah. sit down and talk to anyone, it's appealing to a lot of people. And, and even though that, you know, He's not an honor because he doesn't get everything right. So what? I mean, he's he's doing a ton of good. And and that's so our we, standard. We can't really like too many people. Right. That violation, sending technical nukes. Done. Uh, but yeah, he. I mean, it, it's it's tremendous what he does, and and it's and if more people were, were like him, then you know, conversation would be so much nicer. Absolutely. So, uh, all right. If you've got nothing else, we can we can kind of wrap the episode up. Let's wrap it up. Uh, we did not discuss this. Do you have a free market? Oh no, we didn't. I mean, the whole episode. This was was whole episode was a free market story. Yeah, and I say we go with it. Okay, I could probably conjure up something, but it would be yeah, a lot we, of me, we, him, and Hall. We started a little late, and uh, we just threw it together. So this entire episode was a free market success story, basically. Uh, uh, show notes page again is mcflugel.com slash 97. Uh, so subscribe to this podcast, run iTunes and tractors. Do you think that I forgot about that? Yes.
No, I didn't. <laughs> Good, I ruined it. Yeah, you ruined it. Now people are going to think, I'd like to come in at the 11th hour and say, I'm going to do it anyway, as if it, if you didn't just say that. I mean, that is the show, li- show this notes page. That is literally the one note I wrote for this episode. You know, we're talking yeah. about a lot of stuff, a lot of complicated things, things I actually had to prepare for. Like, normally I don't do three seconds of preparation for this, but I actually listened to about an hour of this podcast. So I did a lot of work, but, but still, even with that, the only thing I wrote other than the date, because I always forget that, and I wrote the episode number and kind of the basic title because I forget all of that whenever I do this. The only thing I wrote under that in my notebook was tractors. And you dropped the ball. You didn't I didn't drop the ball. I was going to say it. Didn't say like it. I, okay. Well, I'm not ready to say it yet because it, I wasn't at the point yet, but if you will... <sighs> Also on the show notes page, uh, you will find uh, uh, ways to apply to be the new co-host of the Rollo and Slappy Show because <laughs> Rollo got fired. So no, I'm sorry, um, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, so uh, subscribe, subscribe to us on the uh, man. I can't even put words together. Uh, you can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes and Stitcher as well as uh, basically any other podcatcher. They all it's the free market. Just goes out and steals our podcast feed and, and publishes on their site. Intellectual for, property. Yes. Uh, also subscribe to our uh, our email newsletter. And if you do that, we'll send you a discount to go shop at libertymugs.com where I hear that there's rumblings that there's going to be a tractor mug soon. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. That's the best you got? Yes. I liked mine better. Oh, I didn't like yours. <laughs> I was going to talk about tractor regulation, but earlier, but I didn't, that would have been good. Yeah, but it, it, I didn't. There was never a good spot to fit it in. You know, Bob Murphy needs more material. I know. It, well, yeah, I should do that for for him, for the sake of him and and the Contra Krugman podcast. Yeah, he does talk about tractors. And there was another episode recently on Tom Woods that they were talking about tractors. And it was not Bob Murphy. Another guest on the Tom Woods show was talking about tractors. We have listeners all over the place. I know. It's amazing. They should be more outspoken that that's where they get their That's fine. They material. can take it, man. It's, uh, it's we'll, true. We don't believe in IP. IP. That's, we don't care. That's, that's fine. That's one of our Liberty mugs is the mug says, feel free to copy. We don't believe in IP. Right. Um. So you can take our tractor ideas. Yeah. You can. Uh, also, what else is on the show notes page? Um, oh yeah, I'll, I'll say it again. If you're thinking about doing the Tom Woods Liberty Classroom, but you don't think that gaining that wonderful knowledge about everything that they don't teach you uh, in school that you're not supposed to know is enough for you to do it, if you sign up for the Tom Woods Liberty or uh, Liberty Classroom through our link on the show notes page, and you let us know that you did that via email or tweet or something, we will send you a free Liberty mug. And it's not a large one. Not just I mean if you want the eleven ounce one, you can do you can get an eleven ounce one. But it also is includes a large one. Well not include it, it's you could also get the large one. And it's free shipping too. So when we say it's free, it is completely and utterly free, other than your mon- the money you spend on the Liberty classroom. But you know that's not for the mug. No, That's it's not for the mug. And if you buy it through another link or not through someone's link, then you don't get a Liberty mug and your life is not complete. Also on the show notes page, we will put the uh, the link to the uh, the Joe Rogan Experience podcast with Dave Rubin. You can listen to that. Also, you should check out our friends' podcasts like Mance Raider and the Free Man Beyond the Wall podcast. Uh, and he was just on the Friends Against Government podcast, which I learned that um, don't listen to the Friends Against Government podcast when you're like going on a run or something because uh, I think I almost died because I was laugh trying to not to laugh while I was run out of breath running. It's not a good combination. But they were talking about the memes and it was a lot for me to handle. Yeah, it was, it was a good episode. Uh, also, Jeremiah Harding. There's the Peaceful Treason podcast. And then uh, Dino with the Rogue File. And speak. I mean, it's this incestuous Friends podcast thing. Dino was just on uh, Mance Raider's podcast, so 
check that out too. It's it's like so much crossing of bridges and everything that you hear each other on each other's stuff, and it's it's neat. Actually, Jeremiah Harding's going to be uh, on the Friends Against Government podcast on Wednesday, I believe. So that will be good. Listen to that. Jeremiah has been on our podcast. Yep. Uh, anything else? Do you want to say track? Do you want to say interrupt me and say tractors again? Is no, if, I already did that. Yeah. Why would I do it again? I don't know. Yeah, it's done. It's a nat violation. I mean, thanks, thanks to the free market, I can send. Ta- yeah, we ta- would have to argue nukes. over definitions. No, we're arguing over definitions. If you're going to call that a nat violation, well, we'll figure out what we, the state is later. Yeah. We, yeah. I mean that's that's considering how much we call each other how much we call people statists that believe in the state we, well before I get in trouble thanks for listening we'll catch you next week peace